All right, welcome to our vodcast on how did plants evolve. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about the changes that have happened to plants in at least our um, recorded fossil history. So uh, we're going to be taking a look at a number of different changes in plants that we've seen looking at plants throughout the fossil record as well as looking at the different types of plants that we see today. Okay. Now, if you guys remember, I gave you a task before spring break to try to find a way to survive with your feet permanently anchored in cement. And I do want to bring this up in class tomorrow and share, um, have you guys share some of the things that you guys chose to do to in order to survive in this type of environment. Because really, this is what a plant has to do all the time. They're anchored, they're not mobile, and so there's a number of ways that they have to get around these um, necessities of life, being able to get nutrients and oxygen and water, and to be able to reproduce when you can't move to your mate, as well as to deal with changes in their environment. Okay, um, a few quick facts before we get started, and the first is that scientists do believe that plants evolved from an ancestor of green algae, and that was the member of the kingdom Protista. Remember we talked about there being plant-like protists and animal-like protists, and those plant-like protists actually had chlorophyll, or something we call proto-chlorophyll, that allowed them to make their own food, and so that algae was most likely the ancestor of all of our living plants today. So these early plants were probably similar to today's moss, um, and we see that when we look at the fossils of those plants. Now the problem with these plants is they were dependent on water to reproduce and also to avoid drying out. Um, so they had to live in the water. They weren't actually able to, to get out of the water. So if we take a look at why plants would make the move from living in the water to living on land, we take a look at some of the, the biggest advantages that might have given them. And of course, um, if, you, if you take a moment to think about this, it will probably come uh, to you because it's kind of common sense. Well, so the advantages of life on land is there's more sun on land than there is under the water. And there's more CO2, so it's easier, of course, to breathe when you're on land than it is to breathe in the water. And there are more nutrients. Um, the soil has more nutrients than there are floating around in the ocean. And so the move to land had a lot of advantages for the plants. The problem is there were disadvantages as well. And that big disadvantage was you lost the water that you were floating in, and so you had to find a way to avoid drying out. Um, the other was um, reproduction. The, these plants didn't have any way to reproduce without the water. So we have to look at the adaptations that plants did develop in order to thrive on the land, because you'll notice the advantages of life on land outweigh those disadvantages. But if you can't overcome that disadvantage, it's not worth the move because you're gonna die. So we take a look at how they avoided that disadvantage while taking advantage of all of the cool stuff that land had to offer. Okay, um, There were a few adaptations that we do see both in the fossil record as well as in the different types of plants that we see um, that we have currently on earth. The first is that some plants develop a cuticle, and that's a waxy covering that prevents water loss. And you'll actually see this cuticle on all land plants, all plants that exist um, or grow places where there is very little water or where they're not growing in the water. So some swampy plants don't have a cuticle, but most plants do. So, And that's a waxy covering on their leaves that prevents water from, from escaping. The second is vascular tissue. So not every part of the plant um, is touching the water now that the plants are living on the land. So they're, they have to have these tubes that transport materials up and down. Now, you'll notice that, of course, the roots are on the bottom of the plant and they are where the water is. So xylem is the tissue that pulls water up from the roots. And then something called phloem takes sugar from the leaves where the photosynthesis happens and gives that to the roots so that the roots can have energy to grow and do their job. So there's an easy way to remember this and it's a little rhyme that I'm going to probably have you repeat in class and that is xylem sucks water up. 
flow em, flows food down. Xylem sucks water up, flow em, flows food down. So your food is going from the leaves to the roots and your water is going from the roots to the leaves. So you have xylem sucking water up and you have phloem flowing food down, okay? And the last adaptation that we do see is seeds instead of spores. Now, spores are like a proto-seed, like an early seed, but they needed water to reproduce. Um, they could not reproduce without being in the water. Seeds provide the embryo, the little baby plant, with food and protection that it needs to survive in a dry environment. So seeds provide that, that extra little oomph that the plants need in order to um, to reproduce without living in the water, okay? Now I'd like for you to take a look here um, at this phylogenetic tree. Now if you remember phylogenetic trees tell us how organisms are um, related to one another. Now we take a look down here, this is the common ancestor. This is where we know all plants came from. And then I want you to take a look at each of these mutations that are adaptations that we talked about. We talked about the cuticle, we talked about vascular tissue, the xylem and the phloem, we talked about seeds, we talked about fruits and flowers. Now, if you'll look at where each of these adaptations occurred, you will see, for example, that algae did not have a cuticle, but bryophytes do. And then bryophytes, however, don't have vascular tissue. They branched off prior to the vascular tissue mutation. So this vascular tissue adaptation occurs down here, which means that everything over here, the ferns, the gymnosperms, the angiosperms, they have vascular tissue. So this mutation occurred, it was one of the first mutations to occur, and you see it in most of the plant kingdom. You have xylem and phloem. But if I were to ask you, for example, what do ferns not have that gymnosperms and angiosperms have? Well, you would look here and see what, where did ferns branch off and what is the mutation that separates ferns from gymnosperms and angiosperms. And you will notice that that mutation right here is that these gymnosperms and angiosperms have seeds and ferns and bryophytes don't. So you can look here on this phylogenetic tree to see what the mutations are that separate each one of these uh, four groups of our plants. So our bryophytes, those are our tiny mosses, and we'll talk a little bit more about those in just a second. And then your ferns, which have vascular tissue, where bryophytes do not have vascular tissue. And then when you see the first seeds are the gymnosperms. They have seeds, and then you have angiosperms, which are our most advanced plants, and those are the plants with, the, with fruit and flowers, okay? So we'll come back to this family tree um, again in just a minute. I'm going to talk a little bit about our bryophytes and ferns first, okay? So the bryophytes were the very primitive plants. These are seedless. They're non-vascular, so they have no seeds. They have no vascular tissue, and um, they do have a cuticle. So they did have that initial adaptation. Well, this allows them to get a little away from the water, but because they don't have vascular tissue to suck that water up, they have to stay in the water. So you're always going to find bryophytes in the water. Um, these include, uh, it also means that they have to stay close to the ground because they're not able to pull water up. They have to be able to get water to the whole plant. So they have to be low to the ground and they have to be near water. They also don't have seeds, which means that they must reproduce in the water. So some examples are plants like mosses and liverworts and hornworts, and they look something like this. I'm sure you've seen these. They're the kind of plants that you always see growing at the very edge of, say, a lake or a stream, okay? So again, we're gonna, that was the bryophytes, and we're gonna look now at the ferns, okay? The ferns are seedless but they have vascular tissue. So this means that they can grow a little bigger than our bryophytes did. And so they do have a cuticle, okay? 
Do they have vascular tissue? Yes. Okay, that was the mutation that separated our ferns from our bryophytes. They do not have seeds, however, which means they're still tied to the water in order to reproduce. So you'll never see ferns growing very far from the water. In fact, they like to kind of lean over the water because they need that water in order to reproduce. So of course, these um, some examples are ferns, um, horsetails, um, equestiums. You guys might have seen these. They, they, they're called cattails. They're related to um, the ferns. So um, I'm sure you guys have seen these. You'll always find them somewhere near the water. Now, you won't necessarily be in the water, but they'll be close to it, okay? So then what separates our ferns from our gymnosperms, of course, is the mutation of seeds. And so you'll notice that gymnosperms, they have cuticles and vascular tissue and seeds, so that starts off our gymnosperms. These are our vascular seed plants. So this is the first time we really see seeds in the evolution of plants, okay? They do have cuticles, they do have vascular tissue, but their leaves are reduced to needles in order to prevent water loss. You'll see this in cactuses, you see this in pine trees, and um, so you'll, these are basically your trees that have needles rather than, than large leaves. Do they have seeds? Yes, but they're naked seeds. Um, and we'll talk about what that means in, um, in just a second. Um, some examples, of course, are the pine, the spruce, the ginkgo. Now, um, you might not realize it, but on pine trees, you can always find male and female pine cones. And I'm going to show you where they are here. This is actually a female pine cone, and this is a male pine cone on the same branch. So some of you guys might have seen these before and thought they were like baby pine cones, but they're actually not. They're actually the male reproductive organ of the gymnosperms. And then this is the female reproductive organ. But you'll notice there's no fruit on these pine cones. They're just there to protect the seed because the seeds are naked. The seeds don't have any um, anything protecting them or anything to help nourish them. Um, but it is a step away from the water. So these guys are finally able to reproduce without being near the water. And so you'll find these trees everywhere, these, these uh, plants everywhere, including places like the desert. Okay. Up next, we're going to talk about our angiosperms because these are our final and most advanced evolution of our plants. And these are the flowering plants. Um, I'd say that, that probably 90% of the plants that you can think of off the top of your head will fall into the angiosperms category. These are our vascular seed plants. There are pretty flowers. Um, and they, they have all of the adaptations that we've discussed so far. They have a cuticle to protect their leaves from water loss. They have vascular tissue to transport their water and food. They have seeds and their seeds are protected by flowers and fruit. These help the plants to disperse their seeds and also to help nourish their seeds while they're in the ground growing. Some examples are all of the flowering plants, grass and corn. Um, I, I give two um, of my personal favorite examples. This is a butterfly posy, but this is the stinking corpse lily. It's the largest flowering plant. These guys can flower and be up to like five feet uh, in diameter, and they smell like a rotting corpse. And I want you guys to think about what advantage that might give in terms of pollination. Now you guys are doing a bit more work on angiosperms in the research that you're doing on the flowering plants and so I'm not going to go into that here because I really just wanted to focus on how these plants have adapted or changed over time. So this was focused more on the evolution of those plants and we will um, be going over some of this. Make sure that your notes are complete and I will see you in class tomorrow. Thank you.